We're moving to what people focus on in their business every day. They grow their business. They run their business. You know, marketing is the topic today. And there's a little bit of marketing on both sides of this. Growing your business, for sure, we think of naturally with marketing. But marketing our, our, our listings is part of it as well. And that's kind of a running your business function. I've already got the listing. Now I've got to market it to get it sold. So with that, let's do a deeper dive. Just a reminder from a lead generation standpoint that our lead generation is prospecting based with marketing enhanced. Prospecting is more time intensive, more proactive, more immediate results. Marketing is kind of more passive, more long-term, more money intensive, more kind of creating the right environment for your prospecting to be effective in. So let's do a little thought here. And if you see my screen here, you see there's a couple different things, prospecting on one side, marketing on the other side, and then certain areas of overlap. And this is just kind of, let's start on the left on prospecting. These are just prospecting activities that you can do. We talked about some of these on Friday. Oh, right, phone, phone or face-to-face. -face. Um, fa we call it listings with that agency. As somebody who's selling their house with that representation, that's the FISBO expired. Circle prospecting, community outreach, all those things we talked about last week. Let's move over, move over onto the marketing side because there's lots of venues here of things that you can do to kind of get your message out there. Exactly. And... I want to start before we get too deep in this by referencing uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. I, I, I think I've mentioned his name before in this class. Quick show of hands. Anybody familiar with Gary V? Right. Really one of the marketing geniuses, I think, of our generation. Um, all over the internet, if you want to look him up, lots of audiobooks, podcasts. Uh, you'll have to wash your ears out afterward because he drops more F bombs per square inch than any other podcaster that I know of. But I will tell you, that Gary Vaynerchuk really is considered one of the marketing geniuses of our generation as it relates to social and digital. And, and a little history background, he's a guy born in Belarus. His family's business was a liquor store in, in Springfield, New Jersey. And um, he took that liquor store from a three-lane buy right once he, on the back of a YouTube channel where he created Wine Library TV, and started to do wine reviews because he's a really, really, in addition to a great marketing genius, he really is a world-class expert on wine. And in the early days of YouTube, and when he created uh, winelibrary.com, and there's thousands of episodes that you can go back. And if you're looking for wine pairings or wine reviews, there's really nobody better. And I can tell you, I, I, my, my experience with Gary is this. His family's liquor store was on Milburn Avenue in Springfield, right down the street from the hospice that I used to run. And back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, before the internet really took off, Gary was stocking shelves. I would go in, we'd talk wine periodically. I, you, you guys, some of you know I love to cook and I once in a while have a special meal and I'll ask him, what should I pair with this? What should I pair with that? And you'd start to see a line for of people just to pick Gary's brain about wine. And um, long and the short of it is this, he's gone now and expanded and took that wine library, which is the now the name of his family's liquor store to a four story internet-based business with Probably, I don't know how big the, the whole downstairs is, but it's almost a whole city block. And uh, now he owns Vayner Media, which is one of the largest media companies in the world with clients like Anheuser-Busch, Nike, and, the, and, the, and all of those guys. Gary knows a lot about social media and marketing. And what Gary will tell you is that today, marketing is content creation. Guys, I'm going to mute everybody because somebody's on the phone and I don't have you muted. What Gary talks about is a couple of things. One is it's not enough anymore just to get a snazzy logo and to just be in front of people all the time. Repetition does matter, right? The mere exposure effect of seeing something again and again and again is a real psychological thing. And so it's repetition and consistency. But what Gary says is it's not enough just to be in front of people. You've got to create enough value. And he says people worry too much about going wider into a wider audience and not deep enough and build relationships within the audiences that you do have. Don't worry about how many likes you have. Don't worry about how many follows you have. Worry about the kinds of depth of relationship that you're cultivating. And what he says, and I totally agree with him, he says that marketing today is about creating content that people want to consume because it adds value to them. 
And so when we're starting to think about how do I market my business, a lot of what we're going to start to think about is what is the kind of content that my audience wants to read or consume in whatever channel they consume it in. And um, some of it's going to be real estate related. Some of it's going to be related to their personal interests. Brian Buffini, the great real estate trainer and marketer, um, talks about people need to like you and people need to trust you. So some of your marketing has to be focused on the trustworthy side. Some of your marketing has to be marketing reports and, and hyper local marketing information to show that you have your thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the community and that you know what's going on with home sales and prices going up and interest rates changing. And how many homes are on the market in town today? How did this compare to what we had last month? That kind of consistency has to happen for people to trust that you truly are an expert. The other thing that has to happen is the marketing has to have a message that speaks to who they are as people. You know, that it's not always real estate related. It's just something that's relevant to their niche. And when we talked about database management and we talked about tagging and how if you tag well, you can craft marketing material that's relevant to their niche. I think I shared as a bit of a amateur foodie, some tags for me included craft beer lovers, wine enthusiasts, barbecue enthusiasts. And for the 12 or 15 people that were barbecue enthusiasts, one of my marketing pieces might be that, um, that Robert Cho up in, 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 in Westwood, the owner of Kimchi Smoke, one of my favorite briskets in New Jersey is teaching a class on how to smoke brisket. That would be something relevant, even though they're real estate consumers, because that matters to them. So when you look at where we do this, all the marketing stuff, online advertising. Now, this is a little bit dated from the standpoint of radio and TV, but there are still agents who use that. There are still agents who, who can find ways into all this broadcast medium to have little spots on radio and TV. I think if you get into some of the very niche little small radio stations, they're frequently looking for content. And if you could do a half hour piece every Saturday morning from 8.30 until 10 on what's happening in real estate in Northern New Jersey, and you became that voice, that expert voice, you're gonna be able to find platforms for that. You can do now what's probably not on here are things like blogging. How many of you guys read blogs or have at any point in your life? How about podcasting? Anybody have any podcasts that you listen to? No podcasters here, huh? Well, okay, Nabila raised her hand, Stacy raised his hand. Look, there's lots of different ways that we can get the message out there. We can create YouTube channels. And, 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 and it doesn't, it's not as technologically challenging as you think it needs to be. A podcast can be hosted with companies for $20 a month. And you just record yourself speaking into your microphone in your phone. You record a little piece and you upload it there. Now you've got a podcast. There's lots of different things, but what we've got to think about is if we're going to understand marketing as content creation, then what is the content and how am I going to put it out there? And what would be the channels that people would consume it on? You know, that's one of the very first things we start to think about. You can do online advertising. There's a lot of folks that do pay-per-click advertising in the very beginning of the internet boom. There's a lot that we do on online advertising with things like social media advertising. How do you put ads with command into people's Facebook feeds. Now, Facebook doesn't allow us to do that kind of hyper-local targeting anymore the way that I described before that PRISM will allow you to do. If I wanna find a very, very niche market of people of this demographic, of this age range, with this income, with this level of education, Facebook today says no longer can do that because a lot of those categories are in fact protected classes. And there was a big lawsuit where Facebook got sued by HUD, Housing and Urban Development Branch of the government that said, when we allow agents to craft these highly targeted Facebook ads by gender and by age and by marital status and by children, we're violating lots of protected classes. So Facebook says you can't do that anymore, but the print media can do it because they've never been sued. And the print media can help you find that target list those names that I showed you before of Billy and, and all those other folks, Roberto and, and whoever, those are your, your reps, right? They can help you narrow that down. What Facebook would allow you to do now is start to think about affiliate audiences. 
if I wanted to try to put my ad, if I was trying to attract a family with kids, maybe middle school age, I can't put those criteria in my Facebook search anymore for my advertisement placement. But what can I do? Well, I can start to say, you know, people like that would probably also be in groups like moms of Bergen County, dads of Bergen County. People who were interested in real estate, possibly selling their home, may have liked Zillow's Facebook page, or they may have visited a mortgage calculator online. And what you can do with Facebook is start to target your audience, not specific by the protected class stuff, but by those affiliations. One of the things that we know is that people who are getting ready to sell their house frequently do home repairs. And one of the best filters to try to find somebody who's getting ready to get their house on the market is people who've liked companies like Lowe's and Home Depot because they're doing home repair projects. And so starting to think about that and think about how do I get my marketing and advertising in front of the audience that I want and then create the content that shows that I have hyper-local knowledge and that I'm an expert in my field. And until you have that expertise yourself, you're going to borrow the expertise of your company and your office until you have your own numbers to show. In the script that we just ran, there was a part of that script that said something like, if you were going to have a heart surgery where you're going to hire a doctor who's only done one of these before or somebody who's done hundreds, and when the person says hundreds, because no one says one, if you really do get somebody who says, I want to get the doctor who's doing this for the first time, it's probably time to end the appointment because they're crazy and we don't have enough time for cray cray, right? So what we do is that script says that people hire me because I've done hundreds of these. And if you haven't, your office has. So you borrow that, right? But the marketing gives lots and lots of different strategies here. Online advertising, broadcast content, radio segments, blogs, podcasting, direct mail, postcards, campaigns, all that stuff. The thing we have to think about in our marketing is there's two flavors. When we're trying to attract sellers, we need to market our brand. When we try to attract buyers, we need to market our inventory. And they're very different. Marketing your brand is getting a message out to your audience consistently that shows that you know what you're talking about that shows that you've got expertise, that shows that you understand the data and you can interpret the data and you know what's happening in terms of buyer mood in the marketplace. That's the kind of content that happens that, that allows sellers to believe that you know what you're talking about, right? And they begin to listen. And, and I, again, I'm a big fan of, of doing it super easy, but I'm a big fan of just parking a YouTube channel out there, attaching that channel to your brand just creating a quick 30 second, 60 second market report every month and just having your, your data right in front of you. And then you just read it. Hey, it's Hal from Keller Williams Realty. I want to just give you a quick update in the market. Today is the 6th of December. Let's talk about November. In the month of November, we had 17 new homes come to the marketplace, which is really down from 35 that we had in the marketplace in October. The average time on market has gone from four days to seven days, seeming to indicate that as you would expect seasonally, things are slowing down a little bit, but the market is still strong. And we talk about that and it doesn't have to be really complicated. It just has to be you showing people that you're talking about the things that show you know what you're talking about, right? And if you start to develop that information out there, you will start to build audience. That's what attracts sellers. Sellers need to work with somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Buyers attract, are attracted to inventory. And so let's talk about brand marketing first. And um, one of the most compelling things to talk about in your brand marketing is outcomes. People promise the world in brand marketing. You know, you, you buy my product and that... Um, you know, within 30 days, you're going to lose six inches around your waist and grow seven inches of, you know, uh, taller or whatever it is. People promise the world. We are so tuned out to that kind of late night TV marketing. Most people believe that a lot of marketing is just a bunch of, of BS. In fact, Seth Godin, another great marketer out there uh, who has a book that I love, is called All Marketers Are Liars. And that's the name of the book. 
and written by a marketer. I thought that was interesting, but he does speak to the challenging stereotypes that we have that people don't believe us. So what matters is we've got to show outcomes. We've got to be able to quantify what we're talking about. When we're talking about that we sell more or we have better, we, we're more effective than other agents, what does that look like? Well, there's a couple key metrics that we've got to keep track of. Things like, how long does it take for your listings to go under contract? How does that compare to the average agent in the MLS? Are you faster or slower? What percentage of your original asking price do you deliver to sellers at closing? And what does that compare like with the average agent in the marketplace? When you're representing buyers, right? How much of a discount off the asking price do you typically deliver? You can tell people that you're a great negotiator, but you have to show it with your outcomes for them to believe it. And so one of the things that we've got to think about in our brand marketing is, am I tracking the numbers? Do I know what the baseline numbers are in the MLS? And if you don't, I believe that your, 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 your market center administrators will pull that or someone in your market center can pull that data for you from the MLS because you have to know what is the average. The average agent is getting homes sold in 35 days and the list of sale retention is 94%. That's really important for you to know so you can see how you benchmark against them. You, you probably would be wise to figure out who are the players in your marketplace? Who are the top listing agents and the top buyer agents in your marketplace? And again, it's a little bit of a challenge from the standpoint that you as an agent can't pull that data easily. You can pull it, but you have to download a lot of information from the, from the MLS into a spreadsheet and massage it yourself. Your broker, your team leader can log into the MLS and pull what we call a market penetration report. And if you want to figure out who are the top listing agents and who are the top buyer side agents in your marketplace, we can pull that data for you and find out what percentage market share do they have. You're gonna find, as we've talked about before, the top dog is never as top as you think. Nobody out there has 30, 40% market share. Entire companies may, but probably not. But we can get that data for you. It would be smart to take a look at who are the top dogs and what does their marketing look like? Because something that they're doing is working. And every company needs to have an R&D department, right? A research and development department to research what is my competition doing? And then you use the Tom Ferry R&D department, which is the rip off and duplicate version of R&D. What are they doing and, and what can I copy from them? You've got to know what the numbers are and how you compete. Because if you're outperforming your peers, you have a very compelling thing to say in a listing presentation. If you take a listing that's way overpriced just so you can throw your sign in the ground and your numbers start to really look bad, your time on market is way longer than everybody else. Your list of sale retention is way lower than everybody else. Do not think that your competition will not use that against you because they will and they have access to it. And so they will use it against you and it will just make it harder for you. So brand marketing, we think about communicate your knowledge and your expertise. We think about communicating your unique value proposition. What makes you unique in the marketplace? What skills, what background, what knowledge, what do you have that makes you a unique opportunity for them uh, to, to be the best, the best agent? Um, Focus on outcomes and unique benefits they get in working with you. And that's the key to really brand marketing is outcome focused. Um, I just saw in chat, congratulations, Nabil, I'm proud of you. That's so good to see. Anyway, sidebar conversation. I'm gonna move on to inventory marketing. This is where social shines, is selling stuff. Social media is where people go to catch up with each other and see how their families are and watch all kinds of crazy cat videos. But from a marketing standpoint, the way that, that Zuckerberg and everybody like him got to be a multi-gazillionaire is by selling advertising. And what advertises well on social is not necessarily brand advertising because that kind of repetition again and again and again is harder to push into people's feeds. That kind of information is harder to get people to click on. You could, and some people do, do that 30-second YouTube spot, 
push it out there to people who live in a specific zip code and start to build audience. You could do that. But the internet's really designed to sell stuff. And so stuff is, um, it's how we create exposure through this kind of marketing. It's how we create urgency through this kind of marketing. It's really what makes the property look beautiful. It's staging, great photography. That's what needs to happen for advertising stuff on the internet. The thing that we, we focus here on um, the inventory marketing is when we're, when we're doing um, our marketing pieces and we're thinking about our advertising and we're thinking about our flyers and we're thinking about our open houses and all the different things that we do to market our sales. What we've got to do is create this fear of loss. We've got to create the sense that this is the right property for you. And if you don't take action, you're going to lose it. We've got to be willing to make people get uncomfortable and, and risk that fear of loss or they're not going to step forward. So all of our marketing is designed to have great pictures and great copy and ad copy. You think about the things we write. And if you're not good at writing ad copy, and I'm not particularly good at it, there's people you can hire. But, but think about this, the language that we use in our ad copy really matters. Assume that you've got a, a home, beautiful home with a beautiful built-in pool. You could write in the ad, Olympic size swimming pool in the backyard with brand new, uh, brand new liner. That could describe it perfectly adequately. Or you could write ad copy that says, imagine yourself lounging by the pool on a hot summer day with a cold drink, enjoying your kids frolicking about as they play in the pool. Right. If you can use language that creates a visual for them to see, something that creates an experience for them to experience, that's the kind of thing that creates desirability. And that's how we have to think about our marketing. Right. So, so from the standpoint of marketing brand, we do that to attract sellers who know that we're knowledgeable and smart and engaged. We market our inventory. We do that to attract buyers. We do that with visually appealing things with great ad copy that creates urgency and desirability and the fear of loss to get folks to, to take action. Um, here's some questions I'll just throw out to you guys. We're going to actually look at some marketing pieces. And I'm going to ask you guys to critique or give some feedback on some marketing pieces in a minute. Anybody have marketing background before real estate? I'm going to rely heavily on my marketers to kind of give us some feedback as to what do you like and what do you not like. But first question to you guys is, how do you know where the customer is and how do you meet them there? We talked a little bit about finding folks through targeted lists like Prism can create. How else do you got to, do you know who, where your, your, your key buyers and sellers are? Any thoughts about how you'd wrap your head around getting in front of them? Industry events, functions. Industry events, affiliated events, right? Okay. What else could you do? Our followers. Where would you, how would you find those followers? How do you find the right followers? Where would they be? Instagram, Facebook. Okay. In certain targeted groups, right? Okay. How do you communicate your value proposition? What are you going to try to communicate that shows your value proposition? You want to address a need. You don't want to address a need. You want to show your knowledge. We're going to back into hyperlocal expert, right? There's a great book that you could buy, um, and I'm forgetting who the agents are. It's called Hyperfast Hyperlocal Agent, and it, it sort of chronicles the business that Dan, this guy Dan, I'm blanking out of his last name, built sort of in the Metro DC area along the Metro stops. His hyper-local market was like three stops. If you were living inside those three stops, he was the guy who was gonna to try to dominate that market. And constantly being a source of what was happening in that market of information is how he built his business. How can you come from contribution or connect in a meaningful way? How would you do that? Coming provide from, information. Provide information. What else shows empathy? What else can you do in your markets to show that you're an empathic person? Well, make that connection in regards to, you know, again, dressing a need, you know, you know what they're going through. Okay. Somebody else, I want some more ideas. Get involved with the community. Say that louder again, was that, Yuvia, was that you? 
like yes like get involved with the community like what how would you do it like there is this guy in my city actually he's a real estate agent and he has been doing just collect that people send him like venmos and he has been doing this for christmas dinner he started with uh thanksgiving dinners and now he's doing for christmas dinner and i realized it's during the weekends he put like this christmas um boxes in like these big coffee shops that are in the cities for that's people it. to You're put right on the head that's exactly what we're looking for, for yeah for people to put like like toys to give away to the kids yeah, toy drives coat drives collecting food for folks right being he, involved he he has been doing like all the right things he he just goes to all the local places to support like these new people that is opening a new business R &D, right rip off and duplicate how can you do similar things now maybe you don't do exactly the same thing but maybe you do something similar i don't know he's doing like every time i have like a an idea he's just there he's just one step away like he's he's great i cannot say anything about his like really really good i just i'll throw this out to you involving you know, in the community he's doing I, I'll all throw the this good out to you, stuff. you to think about it and everyone else too as well he's he's not the the community can withstand more than one person doing that yeah a lot of people can get involved that way in doing caring things in the community especially now when 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 the economy is still sort of teetering in some ways and there's COVID and all kinds of stuff there's lots of different ways that you can show that you're more than just an agent with a need that you're an agent who cares who wants to do good things i'll just i'll just throw you a, a, a an idea of something that that i did and i'm not in, i'm not really in production but just just as a, as a way of kind of thinking about this and i'll give you a little backstory on this um hurricane sandy Superstorm Sandy. We all remember that. How many people were in New Jersey during that? And uh, we lost power. We lost power for a long time. How many? How late? How long were you guys out without, without power? Five days. A week. Anybody longer than five days? A week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was out seventeen days. Whoa. That's a good news, bad news story. Being out seventeen days. One of the things that happens is you get a little bit of a social media cleanse you really do kind of find that you can sit around a fireplace with your neighbors and kind of work your way through the wine cabinet and talk. And it's really kind of fun. But here's what Keller Williams did, just a total sidebar. When, when we lost power here, you guys know that we have KW Cares, which is a nonprofit organization, a charity that you can make donations to. With every closing, there's a place for you to fill out where you contribute to KW Cares. And um, when Hurricane Sandy happened, one of the things that happened was KW Cares went out and bought about 900 generators. And they bought them and they put them on a tractor trailer truck in Florida and they drove north to the tri-state region. And when they got into the Carolinas, they stopped and picked up five gallon jugs for gasoline because as you remember, gasoline was hard to get and finding jugs to put gasoline in and they came up into the Keller Williams region and any Keller Williams agent or family member who was without power, they gave them a generator. No questions asked. You don't have to prove income. You don't have to give it back. Here's a generator. It's yours. That's what KW Cares did for our families during tough time. I still got one in the garage. And um, a few months ago when we had a big power failure here in town where there was a storm and came through and about half of my town was without power, I just threw out <laughs> into, the, into the Westfield, New Jersey Facebook group, I got a generator and a five gallon jug of gasoline, who needs it? And I, the generator just made its rounds around town for about a week while people were out. And when somebody came back on, I got it back. We circulated it back onto somebody else. Those are the kinds of things that you can do that it doesn't take much, but it gets people to say, I, I like her or him, I like what he's doing because he's caring for people and he's doing that in addition to selling. There's lots of different ways that you can show that you're an empathic person, that you're an empathic business. There's a lot of ways to give back. And I think you wanna think about how do you leverage that? Again, I don't wanna be cynical here. I'm not saying do this for the business. Yeah. I'm saying do this because 
we're members of our community and, and our community, our businesses thrive when our communities are healthy. And when our community needs help, it's us as business owners who need to step up to the best of our ability to fill some of those gaps. But when you do that, you're seen differently. And people want to do business with businesses that they respect. Somebody was going to say something before. Is that you, Yuvia? No, I, I just say yes. <laughs> you're saying preach, preach. Yes. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got you. Now, um, any marketing piece that you have, one of the things to keep in mind should have an immediate call to action. What is a call to action? If I'm going to have some kind of marketing piece, what does a call to action mean? It means I'm asking you to do something. What am I asking you to do is going to be different depending on the marketing piece. I may be asking you to contact me to find out what your home is worth. Tried and true for years and years, probably a little trite in the marketplace today. If I'm doing the, a marketing piece that says, would you donate to uh, uh, families in need? I may be asking you to make a Venmo donation, right? I may be asking you to drop off a gently used coat or, or better still pre-COVID times for you to go and pick it up because then you get to meet them face to face, right? But everything that I send you has to ask you to do something. If every marketing piece just pushes information out without requesting that you do something, it's not as powerful as it could be. If I'm going to send you great hyper-local relevant marketing information, I'm going to ask you then to subscribe, to let me send it every month, right? Everything that we do has to have a call to action. And the, and the craft here is really thinking about What's the ask that I can do that is not so big that it'll scare people off? It's not so big that it's going to be too complicated, but it's, a, it's a, an immediate ask and it's something that you'd be willing to do and it helps us build that relationship, right? Something to be thinking about. All right. I, want, I do want to talk about designs and I think I th uh, about 45 minutes ago or so, I think I sent an email to everybody who's registered for the class. And it says getting started in designs or something like that. And it has three different articles on KW Connect of um, FAQ kinds of articles that talk about how to get started using designs. And so I'm, I'm not gonna um, really do a design class here. But what I am gonna ask you to do is to get comfortable with creating content in the design shop. Get comfortable creating flyers. Get comfortable creating social media posts. Get comfortable creating postcards and things like that. Now, again, on one hand, I just gave you Prism. And Prism's in the business of sending flyers and sending postcards. And there are some agents who will use them for that. But you can buy that list and put it right into command so that you can have more automation if you want to. There's lots of different ways that we can work with Prism on this. But I want you to get comfortable with using the tools in command. I want to show you some examples. This is a postcard that was sent out. And I, I want your feedback on, on how this design works or does not in your estimation. What would you keep? What do you like? What would you do differently when you look at this one? I don't like the fun. angle. It looks cluttered. It looks cluttered. It's like bigger. All right, so let's do one at a time. Uh, cluttered. Who is, who is that? Was that you, Hajar? Yes. Okay. It's cluttered from the standpoint of what? What do you see in here that just makes it too cluttery? The point, so the, it, I think it's making the living room, if that's a living room, look very small and then the kitchen very small. Uh, like there's so many things like being at the pots. I think the way the angle of the picture, it just, it makes every little room smaller than it most likely is. Okay. So the angle doesn't make the rooms look really wet, really good. Yeah. There's a lot of textural things going on here that kind yeah. of make your head feel like it wants to pop off your neck. Uh -huh. You know, they got bricks, I got stained glass, I got this, I got that. And so to some degree, we have to work with what we've got. But could this be more visually pleasing if you were to focus one room at a time and not have everything seem so small and have less um, sort of different patterns and colors and textures and all that stuff? There's a lot going on here, probably too much for most folks. Somebody said something about branding. Who was that? Was that you, Lance? Yeah, I would make it bigger. I love that you're invited. That's very catchy, but I would, what am I invited to? Who sent yeah, me Yeah, you're invited to what, right? You're invited to, does it, here's open house. It's really tiny font, 
right? That should probably be bigger. It shows where, it shows what time. This is just way too small to be eye-catching. What we think about, especially in the social space, we've got to catch it and they're, they're not going to study it usually. It's the same with signs, your for sale signs. I see some people that put way, way too much stuff on their for sale signs because people generally see that as they're driving and maybe if they fall in love with the house, they'll stop and take a look. But we put our name and our broker's name as we have to. If we put a phone number on the signage, remember that if any phone numbers go there, the broker's phone number has to be there as well. So if there's any phone numbers, now you have to have two of them and one of them is labeled office and one of them is named, is named cell or however you're gonna identify them. I see people putting their website. I see people putting QR codes. I gotta tell you something. I've been, I've never, and I'm not saying it's never happened. I've never seen somebody stop the car, run up onto the sidewalk and take a look at that QR code and scan it with their phone on a for sale sign. Never seen it happen. We used those QR codes on signs in the very beginning because it was a new techie thing to do and it made us look like we were smart and had all the coolest new tech. But this branding needs to be bigger. Signage, simple, clean. Postcards, simple, clean, right? Here's the team. It's almost as if they're an afterthought. Do you know what the name of this team is? Can you even read that? Right, so one of the things that you wanna think about is look at these designs when you're creating them and make sure that you've got something that is, that's kind of easier to look at, that it communicates what you want quickly, easily, efficiently. How about this one? Who is this aimed at? There's just way too much stuff on this. Well, is this, are you reaching buyers? Are you looking for buyers or sellers here? Sellers? Could be either or. Could be either know, or. Yeah. I saw, I saw I saw Stella give the I don't know. It's kind of like a, right. So I don't know place? if it's happening to any of you, but I started like this command trying to do some some advertisements and I'm going through the. You know how you just feel, like yeah. what are there is I'm so tired of my picture. Like I can see myself anymore. Because in everything that it's in there, it's like, put your picture, put your picture. I'm so tired of myself. Like, well, you know I, what? Here's what I tell you. You, like, you know, I, I hear so you. I, I hear you. But understand one of the things that we have in our industry is you're the brand. Oh, my God. You're the brand. And it's one of the reasons why so many agents do put their pictures on everything. And, and you don't have to. Look, this is my business card right here. This is my business card. There's a KW logo on the back. This is my director of training. You'll notice there's no picture. There's no real reason to scare anybody until I show up in person. But the point is for a salesperson in real estate sales, your picture is, is one of the things that matters. Now, consistency is important. If you're gonna use your picture, one of the mistakes that I see is people use a different picture on their Facebook page than they use on their business card and a different one on their LinkedIn profile and a different one on their brochures and a different one on their signage. There's no consistency and there's no continuity there. What needs to happen is people just kind of need to be imprinted. So when they see your face, or they if you're not going to use your face, and I don't, because let's face it, I want people to remember you, not just because you're amazingly attractive, which you all are, because I'm looking at you. I want them to remember you because of your skills. Yeah. Your doctor probably doesn't have his or her face on their card. And yet you don't forget who they are. But the point is in our industry, it's, it's something that happens. One of the things, and I'll get back to this piece in a second here, is through repetition, when people see your logo and you can create your logo, you, if you would rather take your picture out and create a, a logo for your business and use that, you can do that. But it's the repetition again and again and again that creates that sense of I remember. I'm gonna talk about my, my first company that I first worked for back in when I first got into real estate. It was Weikert, right? And some of you guys know of Weikert and we sometimes affectionately call them the yellow and black company. And how we became the yellow and black company was this simple. 1969, Jim Weikert, first shop in um, Chatham, New Jersey. Property was about 350 feet deep and he wasn't sure what color combination to put on his signs. 
that people could see and people could read. And so he got three different, four different, five different prototypes, leaned them up against the shed at the back of the property, got all his agents had them stand on the sidewalk and say, which one of these signs can you read? Not surprisingly, the black and white combination, very legible from a distance. It's why it's on all the directional signs that you see on the street. It's why we put all the hazard signs that the road department uses are black and red. School buses, all that stuff, not black and red. That's the KW signs, the yellow and black, <laughs> right? Here's what happens. Now you're driving down the street, guys. And I'm telling you, if you see a yellow and black sign from a thousand paces, you're going to think Weikert sales. That's what you're going to think. You're going to think it's a sales sign. That's kind of what we want with this branding, whether it's your logo, whether it's your, your picture. This is designed to attract sellers. What we said is we attract buyers through inventory. This one is attracting buyers. Come to my open house. This one is attracting sellers. The challenge with this is what does it say? For starters, the picture is really busy. It may be cool that you had a drone and you could take a drone picture, but can I identify that easily as Gem Heights? I don't know. I don't even know where Gem Heights is. Gem Heights might even not be real. This could just be a prototype. They've got a lot of pools and tennis courts. They've got a lot of pools and tennis courts. Would someone recognize that picture as Gem Heights? Would you do better with a more recognizable picture? Could you go out and take a picture of, of the, I don't know, I think about my town. We've got a park, Mindawaskin Park, right in the center of town with a band shell in it. You take a picture of the band shell and people recognize that as Westfield. What could you use that would be, a, you know, that would be identifiable? What does the copy say here? Things are heating up. What does that mean? Does Market it mean it's going to be up. summer and the temperature is getting warmer or what? Yeah, that's what I thought, that it's warm because they it's have warm. pools. Because <laughs> winter time is here, things are heating up. This is gonna be, it's, it's basically trying to communicate that the market's heating up. However, what does this data on the left seem to indicate? Average listing price 262, 362. But then average you're price, selling it for less. It's a 10% wow. discount. That doesn't sound like a hot market to me. Yeah. Total well, active four houses. I don't know. And that's an that. average days of market not, not applicable. That's, that's the not data very doesn't The data doesn't support the claim. If okay. you're going to use data, it's got to support what your claim is, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that the use of data can be suspect. Right, Mark Twain said it best. There's three kinds of lies in the world. There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Because you get anybody, you give people a set of data points and you can massage the numbers to tell whatever you want. But if you're gonna say things are heating up, your data better show it. Yeah, that's so new. Right? So bad. <laughs> uh, how about this one? It's all in the details. What would you do, do differently here? Just put some details <laughs> who said that <laughs> who said put some details me i did whoever was whoever that was was spot on was that you kristen it's all in the details then what the hell details are you showing me what is the detail here i've got a picture of a house not a particularly good one i've got a picture of uh, a vacant lot that's not the <laughs> i've got one that says pending I don't know what details you're talking about. Is there a call to action here anywhere? No. No. It's all in the details. I think what you have here is probably an agent who's just trying to show the community that says, look, I'm doing business. I've got two that I've just listed. I've got one that I've got under contract. I'm an active agent. Uh, this doesn't communicate that, right? He also should change that pending to under contract because pending it's like a yeah well different states this template no. was from kansas wichita kansas different states actually use different language oh okay for new jersey we're required to use under contract by mls rules other states th they do use pending contract i thought for pending it's like coming soon maybe yeah and that's part of the confusion which is why in new jersey we use under contract and we use coming soon for coming soon now in the mls's we don't use pending anymore in New Jersey. The point of the matter is there should be a call to action. There's not one here. There's an opportunity for an agent. If you can, if you're trying to show that you're taking new listings and you're a busy agent, a different piece would communicate that better. 
the point is, we go back to what we said the other day. It's message and method. What is the message? Is, is the audio and the video lining up? Is what I'm saying supported by the data? Is what I'm saying supported by great pictures? You know, I think things, these things could be better. And when you start to play around in command, what I want you to do is start to design your own pieces and think about is the data supporting what I'm saying? Are the pictures creating the best possible image? If I'm trying to brand myself, how do I show market relevant knowledge? If I'm trying to brand and find buyers, I'm gonna to try to attract people to inventory. Am I doing it at the highest level possible? That's the thing you always wanna be thinking about. And go in and play. Right, go in and play. I sent you some links that you can start to use. Now, in the couple minutes that we have here, I do want to focus on a couple of things briefly. We can do social media posting through command. And we can schedule some of this in command. And what I'd encourage you to do is start to think about how do you consistently get your branded messages, sometimes looking for buyers, inventory branded, sometimes looking for sellers, you know, your own personal brand branded. How do I get those to go out in, into social media consistently without having to be plugged into my social media accounts all day? Because I know that social media can be a really big black dark hole. We get sucked in. And I, I, I can tell you, I, I, I personally, and this is just me, but personally I've decided to kind of step away from social a little bit. I think socials um, started to go into a direction that I'm not really comfortable with. If you watch the Netflix videos on, on, on social and all the different things that's happening with the algorithm and the way that we're using these channels to divide us, I think it's, it's, social is a challenging place these days. And yet it is where people are and it is where we have to be. But we don't have to be here all day and we don't have to get sucked into drama. In fact, we shouldn't. We should try to avoid that. And the way to avoid that easiest is to carve out some time and to get into the schedule. And just to say, this is the post that I'm going to put at 10 o'clock on Monday. This is the post I'm going to do at 2 o'clock on Monday. This is the one. And we schedule them all out in advance. It might take 45 minutes or so, half hour or so, just to schedule your post for a week and let the scheduler push those out to the audience when it's time to go. So you don't have to remember to go in and do it in real time. I now, are these going to your personal page or to the individual? Uh... Going to your business pages. This okay. is all coming through command. Now, if you want to schedule onto your personal pages, I believe you can do that through third-party software. Companies like Hootsuite or lots of different companies. You can just Google social media scheduling software. You can find ways to do it. But I am going to really encourage you to schedule it in advance time block time to pick all the posts for a week, have them done, and then use your social media accounts strategically as you want to. I'm not going to say don't be involved in social. There's lots of folks who are, but, 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 but try to not get sucked into it because it's really easy to jump on your social media account at 30 in the morning and then suddenly look at your watch and go, ooh, how did it get to be quarter after 10? Hey, Roddy, just on a note, if you post it to your business page, you can share it to your personal page. Uh -huh. Good to know. Thanks. Yeah, that's one way that they do it, Lance. Thanks for pointing that out. And a lot of people will, will do that specifically, right? Practice scheduling some posts. I'd encourage you to go in there. And before the end of the day, just practice scheduling a couple of posts and see how they look, right? The other thing I just want to throw out there is practice doing some social media advertising, some Facebook ads. I think right now for agents who are in the growth phase of their business, I think this is one of the ad spend areas that you need to really think about. Because when you start thinking about, okay, I've got to spend some money to make money and advertising is going to get my message out there. I think one of the faster ways to attract buyers into the queue is through targeted property ads, where if you don't have your own inventory to, to advertise, you're going to do an ad for things like find all the homes in Westfield, that have come, come on the market in the last seven days and learn how to capture people who are looking for that information. I'm gonna recommend that you look up Lori Ballen, who is a KW coach. In fact, if you want to, 
and maybe I'll just do it as a matter of course, I can send everybody who's registered for the class on the class list, I can send a couple of emails that show how Lori has used targeted, uh, not targeted, she's used inventory ads as a way of doing some Facebook advertising to get leads into her funnel. What we are finding is through the Facebook ad account, because you are using the company's ad account and not your own, because of the steep discounts that we're generating for agents, the cost per lead this way is about a sixth or about a seventh of what it would cost if you're trying to generate leads yourself on your own Facebook business page. So I will send you an email, it's templated out already, that has a couple of videos that you can watch on how do you create ads like this. There's also going to be some stuff in there from Nick, Nick Baldwin. If you guys are not taking the Wednesday classes with Nick, he just started last week on how to use command. I'm going to encourage you to block 12 to 1 on Wednesdays with Nick. But there's a couple of videos in there uh, from Nick's Command Your Conversion Facebook group that show how do you use command to do some really good advertising and, and how do you use the marketing features there. The idea is doing advertisement for inventory to attract buyers and consistently getting out in front of your own brand for sellers. All right, we're gonna park it probably here. I got five minutes to 12. What questions do you have? Any ahas that you have? Any takeaways from today of how branding and marketing kind of fit into your plan? <laughs> 